Okay, good morning, we'll get started. Welcome to the library, my name is Troy Swanson, I'm the library department chair. Um, I'm excited to introduce Kip Kozad, who's our director of, of tutoring, to, talk about, to give us a short history of Pakistan. This event is part of our One Book, One College program on the graphic novel, Miss Marvel, which you can buy in the bookstore or check out from us in the library. Um, the, the main character and her family are immigrants uh, from Pakistan who live in New Jersey. And so her identity as a Pakistani is a, a key part to this story. So we thought that this would be a good opportunity to explore a little bit of the history behind their family and um, history that has really impacted our world in so many ways. Um, Kip holds a master's degree in history and Middle Eastern studies. So he's our resident expert, um, teaches history too here, right? Um, in that area of the world and into the, in the um, Asian subcontinent. So I am very grateful he's taken the time um, to put this talk together for us. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kip. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Troy. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. We're going to learn a little bit about Pakistan. And um, you know, as part of this, uh, as Troy mentioned, it comes from this book, uh, Ms. Marvel. And if you're not familiar with it, like he said, it, it deals with a Pakistani-American from uh, the East Coast. And some of the uh, content in this book deals with different issues. It's kind of interesting if w once you read it that um, you know you always have this like whenever you have people that are either from the Middle East or from the you know South Asia, you, know, you always have this East versus West, and even more so if you are uh, Pakistani American because England played such a large role in the colonization of. Uh, Pakistan, and so there is that experience with the West. So, you know, there is this back and forth. There is also this kind of conflict that exists in Pakistan, and, and uh, it's brought here. Also kind of uh, something very similar in the region of kind of conservative versus liberal. And one of the issues that uh, the, the, uh, the main character, her name is Kamala, has to deal with is dealing with parents that have certain expectations of her culturally and other things. In fact, I put a quote here uh, from this um, graphic novel fr from her. It says, you and Baba, Baba being father, you and Baba want me to be a perfect little Muslim girl. Straight A's, med school, no boys, no booze, then some hand-picked rich husband from Karachi and a billion babies, right? And this is kind of a narrative that a lot of, I see you guys smile, a lot of uh, ladies here can kind of associate. Um, and this is a this is a picture from the um, from the graphic novel, and you can see the characters in the back. And you'll notice that um, her mother and many people are wearing the head covering the hijab, and she is not. And so again, there is that kind of conflict that you see sometimes in the region of conservative versus liberal: what's expected, what's not expected. So. To kind of get into the history, making kind of a, a divergent from the, the book, first you need to understand where Pakistan is. And um, here on the map you can see that uh, it's located to the west of India. Uh, at one time this was a, you know, part of a, we'll get into details about this, but it was part of a, a British colonial effort that combined all of these together. Um, and you know, we'll get in more detail, but you'll notice that it fits kind of right in between Western Asia and Eastern Asia, kind of in the crossroads. And like I said, we'll get into more detail of that um, as we go along. So the first thing to understand is when we get into Pakistan, knowing that it is, and for those that aren't familiar with it, it's uh, almost completely an, an Islamic country. But um, I want to talk a little bit about how Islam came to the region. Um, the first Muslims swept down in about the 12th century from Afghanistan. And uh, these were like, Afghan led, uh, lots of Turkish warriors involved, and they formed kind of, they had what's called the uh, Ghaznavid Empire. And the Ghaznavid eventually uh, grew in a different form until the Delhi uh, Sultanate, which lasted from the 13th to the 16th century, again being dominated by Muslim leaders. Um, in East Pakistan, um, one thing also we'll talk about is that in the area that would become Pakistan, you would have East Pakistan and West Pakistan, and it would be created into kind of a Muslim state, but it would be separated by India and Nepal. But the, the Muslims that um, came to East Pakistan, there were many Sufi missionaries, and we'll get into Sufism here in a minute. There were quite a few Arab traders that traded along the Indian Ocean, and there were a lot of Turkic-speaking invaders who also, um, during this period when the, these people came from, um, from the West, 
settled in this area and created these kind of two very strong pockets of, uh, of Islamic culture and society, and it spread kind of throughout uh, India. We'll talk more about that. Then you have the Mughal Empire, which was from the 16th to the 18th century. And it really was the Mughal Empire that really had this flowering of Indian uh, Islamic culture that uh, combined Persian, uh, Hindu, and Muslim art, science, and literature. And one thing to keep in mind is that the, um, the, those that were Muslim in Pakistan uh, did not speak the original language of Islam, which was Arabic. They spoke Urdu, which was very much connected to uh, the people in and around them, the, the Hindus that were in, in, in and around them. Another strong influence in this area were Sufi Islam, who are more, they're kind of considered the more mystical form of Islam. Um, they have kind of this devaluation of materialism. Um, they also have some things that certain sects of, of Islam considered to be kind of not in the mainstream, such as saint veneration uh, and this idea of kind of giving up worldly possessions. Um, but most of the Muslims that um, would come out of this area were Sunni in their belief system, and it, it became very strong. Um, but what's interesting about the, uh, even the Sunnis that, existed, that, that lived in, uh, in this region is that they uh, practiced some of the kind of forms that you would see in other, area, other sects of Islam, saint worship, for example, and veneration. Um, and so, and also in this region, you would see the presence of Shia Muslims as well. And so you kind of have everything emboldened or included in this area. One thing to know is that this area in South Asia, most people were Hindus. The strong, um, the strong centuries old traditions were often shared between Hindus and Muslims. So there was this kind of, they were living side by side. They shared a lot of their culture. Another thing that was common was the notion of class. And if you know anything about Hinduism, there's a caste system that existed in Hinduism. And they didn't have a caste system per se, but there was definitely class distinctions within um, the Islamic areas in this region, in South Asia. Of those that converted to Islam, most of the people were poor. Because if you're wealthy and you've already kind of established establish yourselves in kind of the Hindu culture, a lot of times you wouldn't give that up because you would be giving up a lot of your kind of support and your foundation. So a lot of the people originally that converted from Hinduism into Islam were poor. Those that were in the elite, kind of the upper class, um, usually can have, connect, usually have connections to kind of this a uh, Afghan Turkic uh, groups and also Arab blood ties. And this is kind of very common within uh, Islam to have ties to those um, first uh, Arabs that kind of settled in, in other areas. Um, there were incidents of Muslim leaders in majority Hindu regions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, but what's interesting is that not only did they allow Hinduism, and keep in mind that in kind of the traditional um, Islamic culture, that if you weren't a person of the book, that is a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim, you were considered a non-believer. And so in most areas where Muslims would take over areas where they're non-believers, people were highly encouraged to convert to um, Islam. But in, in India, in this area, in the Indian subcontinent, um, South Asia, that not only did a lot of these leaders allow Hinduism to flourish, but they also adopted some uh, Hindu practices and, and kind of included that. It's, but this isn't something kind of real rare. I mean, if you think of Christianity, those people who are familiar with the Christmas tree, that's a pagan thing, right? They, the, before the Christians came to Germany, the German pagans would bring the tree into their home. And so, you know, you see this throughout the world where there's kind of a merging of uh, different religions based on the traditions that existed in different areas. Um, some of the interesting kind of things that the, the Muslims practiced in some of the areas was um, like some Hindu ceremonies. Um, you would see yoga and shrine worship. And you know, this was among the South Asian Sufi in particular. So a lot of kind of mystical um, things. And you're probably, a lot of you are familiar with this building. You've probably seen it at one time or another. This is the Taj Mahal. Um, it was built under the direction of uh, Shah Jahan. 
Um, and it was finished in 1653. And does anybody in here know what it is? Because a lot of people say, I'm going to the Taj Mahal. They think that they're going to like a house or a palace, right? What is this? It's a, it's a sh not a shrine, it's a tomb, right? It's a tomb for his wife who died giving child, g g having died in childbirth. And the interesting thing is that Shah Jahan was going to build another one that was black on the other side of the river. So there's a river that goes right behind. It's very, it's almost like, you know, not much bigger than a stream. But on the other side of that river, he was going to build a black Taj Mahal where he was going to be buried. But his son intervened. He kind of overthrew his father and put his father in jail. So he never did get to build uh, the second black uh, Taj Mahal. So that brings us to the British. And, um, you know, they're going to play a big role in, in a large part of this lecture. But one thing I want you to keep in mind that South Asia, um, the whole Middle East, all of this area flourished as a, as a huge culture, civilization, trade block for centuries through the Indian Ocean. And it wasn't until the Europeans came, first the Portuguese and then um, other Europeans, culminating with uh, the British rise to power, that they kind of broke up all of those trading uh, groups and began to colonize, in, in large part, um, huge sections of, of Asia, including South Asia. As Britain rose in power, they, they defeat the, the French at Plassey in 1757, and they began to cement themselves as kind of the sole ruler of, uh, of India. Um, and the British often used ethnic division to assert control. That is, oftentimes they would play Hindus against Muslims. And so, um, as is the case in a lot of different places, in, in pa uh, Palestine and other places, that the British were really good at playing one side off the, off the other um, in order to maintain their rule. And they did this, they ruled in, in two different ways. They had direct rule, so wherever there was areas where they could get maximum amount of money and profit, they would rule directly with their own British leadership. But in other areas, um, they would allow the local people, uh, local rulers to rule kind of indirectly. And these areas in uh, Britain um, were known as the, the princely states. And so you can see, here's a map of, of India under British administration. This is a map of in 1937. But you can see that you have the British India, which would be the, the uh, excuse me, the pink area. And then you'd have the princely states, which would be the, um, the yellow area. So the, the yellow states were allowed to have much more self-government and much more autonomy than the other parts um, of India. And this is a fascinating map here. This map shows you the Muslim population of India. And you can see, and this is in a census taken in 1941. So this is before the, we have the split that we're going to be talking about. But if you look on this map, the um, green would be the most Muslims, the yellow would be the least amount of Muslims. You would assume in the yellow would be largely um, Hindu, but you also have Sikhs that live up and kind of close to Pakistan. We'll get into the, or the northern part at this point of, of, uh, of India. And so you can kind of see, here's your Muslim, huge numbers of Muslim population here, and here's your huge number of Muslim population there. And then ultimately you can kind of see when it gets divided, where it's going to get divided. You can see this uh, by and large. And if anything, it's like, gr like light green or blue, then you're getting you know, into sections that have good, uh, large amounts of, uh, of Muslims within uh, South Asia. So moving forward, um, it becomes apparent um, during and particularly after World War II that the British are going to start this whole process of decolonization throughout um, their, their colonies all over the world. And one thing that kind of laid the groundwork for um, Brit uh, in India becoming independent and then how it's going to become independent was World War II. During World War II, the Indian Muslims were much more participatory in the conflict with the British than the Hindus were. The Hindus were trying to use the conflict by and large to force the, the British to give up India, to allow them to become independent. 
And so a lot of people believe that um, because the, the Muslims were much more active uh, and supportive in the conflict against the Japanese and the Germans in, uh, and the Italians in, in World War II, that the British would reward them for that afterward. And, and the, the Muslims largely expected that. And this is one reason they became so active in, in the conflict. So we'll get through a couple, three people um, that were uh, influential in the independence movement and also in this partition that we're gonna talk about, the split that's going to happen uh, once the British leave. Probably familiar with this guy, Mahatma Gandhi, who was kind of the father of Indian independence. He was very much repulsed by the idea of India becoming two states. And this time, all the way before World War II, going into World War II and after, there is going to be this big kind of idea of what's going to happen when the British leave and what are, how are we going to address kind of the religious issue. And keep in mind, when we were looking back at the Mughal Empire and the empires that ruled kind of large sections of India before, a lot of these were led by Muslim-focused uh, individuals. Well, the problem that they saw that once the British left is those, those people would by and large be gone. There would be no real opportunity for a Muslim to rule India because it had such a large, um, it had such a large Hindu population. And so a lot of the Muslims became concerned that they would be, because their population was so much less than, than that of the, um, of the Hindu population, that they wouldn't have much self-governance. They wouldn't be able to kind of control what's going to go on with a narrative in an independent India. And so um, he, uh, Gandhi, actually went on hunger strikes when he's, you know, this notion of dividing up India. He went on hunger strikes for a variety of things, but that was one, an, one of the things that he did. Um, he had said at one point that he would rather die than see India divided. And so he was obviously a big proponent of keeping India together as a nation. One of the key figures that pushed for um, uh, like an independent Muslim state was Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And he was the leader of the All India Muslim League. Um, he was a very, like those people that came in contact with him, he was kind of a very serious person. Um, you can kind of see it a little bit. Um, and he continuously was pushing for an independent Muslim state throughout this whole process. And he believed that there should be uh, like a, a two nation um, recourse to dealing with Indian independence, what was called the new na two nation theory. And he desired a Muslim national ho homeland. And one thing that's interesting about um, Jinnah is that he wasn't particularly religious and this was true of a lot of the Muslim leaders in in uh, you know at this time that a lot you know some of them were known to, to drink and do some of the things that uh, Muslims don't traditionally do but they did want to see you know their the Muslim taken care of and that doesn't mean that there weren't other people that were very serious about their faith but a lot of those that were in this kind of forefront would you know kind of be in a different group Another uh, individual, last person I'm going to talk about is Nehru, and he was a member of the Indian National Congress, um, and he desired as well in, uh, a unified India. Pretty much all of the Hindus wanted to keep India together. They believed that they would be a much more powerful um, nation if they kept it together. And one thing I want to also share about this, um, this topic is that um, for centuries, the Muslims and the Indians had lived side by side in villages together, in peace together. Their kids played together. They went to the same schools. So this notion of creating an independent Pakistan or a Muslim and Hindu kind of div division was very alien to a lot of people. It was a lot of the religious figures um, and the leaders at the top who were wanting to see um, this division. And so, you know, a lot of people on the ground were used to their lives of living peacefully side by side, Hindu, Muslim together, praying in different places, but, you know, doing a lot of things um, together. So as time went on, it became increasingly obvious in a post-independent India that, you know, there would be this division. And these numbers here that I have are kind of, um, you know, it's hard to say exactly because there were so many people in the census, it was kind of hard, hard to, um, to measure. But roughly about 28% of the people living in South Asia under British rule were uh, Muslim and about 67% Hindu, 67% uh, Hindu. Um, and one of the, obviously, the uh, one of the key independence figures I mentioned was Gandhi. He was a Hindu. 
Um, and the British soon uh, backed this idea of splitting India. And again, it comes back to this notion that the, the British wanted to reward um, the, the Muslims for fighting in the Second World War so vociferously, and that was kind of one of the reasons. But there, you know, there, was a, there was a big problem that the British had, and they knew that if you did have partition, the big issue was where exactly are you going to draw that line, right? Because you know, wherever you draw that line, it's going to create problems. And so Britain, knowing that they were going to leave India, um, they bring in a, a, a person to kind of deal with this whole partition and British pulling out. And his name was uh, Lord Mountbatten. He's pictured right here in the center with the tie. And he would become the last viceroy um, of, um, of British India. And when he got there, one of the first things that he did, they originally had planned to pull out of India in June of 48. He moves the timetable up to August 47. And the reason that he did that is because he knew that once the British left, all hell was going to break loose that there was going to be all kinds of problems. And he thought it would be better not to prolong that and have, have to deal with that um, you know, being British. And keep in mind, this is another kind of narrative to this story, is this whole partition movement and all the things that happened after independence would have never happened if it wasn't for colonialism. Because it was really only the British that were in a position where they could actually divide the country. As I mentioned, there was no strong movement amongst the people to do that. It was only the ones who had been bargaining with the British and dealing with the British of getting them out of there that had made the decision that they need to divide India. If you didn't have this British involvement, if you didn't have this colonialism, you wouldn't have had all the problems that existed um, in, in, um, with the British leaving and the division of, of Pakistan. One other thing that's really fascinating about uh, the division is that there's a lot of similarities between uh, Pakistan and Israel in that um, both sometimes they talk about um, Pakistan Zionism because it was based on, this division was based on religion. Just like in Pakistan, it was a division between Jews and Muslims. Here it was between Hindus and Muslims. They're the only two current states that were created based on religion, talking about Pakistan, talking about Israel, right? And so there are these kind of similarities historically. So as I mentioned, um, the big issue was how to divide um, India. And they brought this guy in, this guy would never want this job. His name was Cyril Radcliffe, and his sole job was to figure out where the borders would be. And um, he was just given five weeks to figure out exactly how he was going to carve up the land between India and Pakistan, right? And in this process, India knew, India and in the area uh, that would become Pakistan, they knew that there was going to be a division but the, but the issue was where the lines were. And right when that happened, what, what ends up happening throughout India is that those that were major, Muslim majority areas that had um, minorities of, of, uh, of Hindus, they began to fight, especially along the areas where they knew about where the border would be. And the same where there was a majority of Hindus that had a minority of Muslims. And so violence begins breaking out even before they announced these lines. And Radcliffe wanted to announce the, this, the borderline as late as possible. In fact, they actually have the independence of the two countries first, and then they announce where the lines are, so then the British can get out real quick. So it's like they know there's a fire in the house, they make, make this line, and they get out, and they leave everybody in the house to deal with the fire while they take off. And that's basically what happens in uh, Britain. One of the hotly contested uh, areas was right in, along this border and what would happen to Lahore. When they finally do divide the line, make the div dividing line, um, the, most of the, the Hindus that are living on the Pakistan side of the, the line, um, they begin to move toward India. And the Muslim, many of the Muslims, not all of them, but many of the Muslims that were on the India side began to move into Pakistan. And through this, you have the death of between one and two million people and all the violence that took place through this partition. So again, it's kind of this colonial narrative. This would have never happened if, it, if the British had not 
taken over India and, and colonized them. So, you know, it was a really horrible um, story. I mean, you, if you go online and, and, and Google it or go onto YouTube and watch videos of it, I mean, the, stor the horror stories that you hear about people killing their neighbors who they had been, you know, neighbors with for generations, right? Or kicking them out and taking their property. I mean, it's just, it's horrible. You know, it's just a, but it's a kind of a, a common trope that you see in uh, with the death throes of colonialism. So let's check and make sure what my time is here. Good, we're good. So with an independent Pakistan, um, and keep in mind, as I said, that Pakistan is going to be uh, made up of uh, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. So you'll see um, West Pakistan being here and East Pakistan being here, where you have the, the large Muslim uh, areas. And what's interesting about this is that it was one country, but it was in two areas. It's kind of like the United States and Alaska in a lot of ways. They, they were ruled um, back and forth. They, you know, they were considered one country. This was going to end in the 70s. We'll talk about that. But it was something that they had to deal with. But um, every intention at the beginning was that Pakistan was going to be kind of a democratic country. But what ends up happening is that um, there was this, um, you know, this impetus that, that they had to do partition. Once the partition was done, and this is kind of common with any kind of endeavor that you think about, kind of this drive that they had for, for state and all of that kind of petered out a little bit with the reality of the state. Um, the influence of the Muslim League waned, and a lot of the bureaucrats who were put in charge began to centralize their power and leaving a lot of people excluded. And one thing that they did is they began to remove some of the key figures and consolidate the power within just a, a few amount of people. And in, from 47, when you have the creation of Pakistan, until 1958, um, you, this was kind of where this happens. In 1958, you have the first of what, what would be a military coup. And you're going to see this kind of go back and forth between kind of having elected officials ruling and then military coups. And this is one thing that's kind of plagued Pakistan um, over time. Um, so one of the quotes here from a book, it says, the outcome was a state in which democratic consolidation was sacrificed on the altar of national security. One of the issues that uh, Pakistan dealt with was being neighbors with India. They didn't get along after two million people died. There was all this contention. And one of the big problems was when they divided up Pakistan, they gave sections along the border to one side that believed that that should be theirs. One of the keys is Kashmir, which we'll talk about soon. But the Indians and the Pakistanis have fought over Kashmir about four different times. And so there's all this conflict. So whenever there was instability in Pakistan, they would always try to, the military would come in and say, we need to establish security because we always have to worry about the Indians causing problems. And so you see that a lot. Um, Another thing that, that a problem that you had in Pakistan is a lot of these elites that I was telling you about owned almost all of the land. And so they kind of um, consolidated all the wealth for them. Many of them lacked a vision um, for Pakistan. For example, there really wasn't any kind of land reform that went on. You saw this happen in India, but you really didn't see it in, in uh, Pakistan where the average farmers could own their land. A lot of times that someone else owned the land in which they were farming. And so, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of um, ownership. Um, most of the people in Pakistan throughout this period, in some cases now, kind of view Pakistan as a state but not a nation because many of them are more uh, concerned about their local area, where they're from, the, the region where they're from. And so this was uh, a big problem. So this brings us to the point that I was talking about, that East Pakistan in 1971 splits from West Pakistan and forms Bangladesh. And um, this weakened the identity of the Pakistani state because they had always formed it as a state for Muslims, that Pakistan would be a state for Muslims. Well, now you had that split into two countries. And so um, that was a big issue. The Indians played a big role in uh, East Pakistan splitting away because they didn't particularly like having two Muslim countries on either side of them that they had to be concerned with. So they meddled, obviously, in uh, the division in Bangladesh. Um, 
So with all the instability that occurred in Pakistan, they became more and more dependent on outside aid and assistance. And one of the countries that they got most of their aid and assistance was the United States. They, the United States became, begins to play a larger role. And there's a reason for this, because India throughout this whole period had remained pretty much independent of either the Russians, the Soviet Union, or the United States. And if you know anything about the Cold War, the United States was fighting this kind of global war between communism and free market that existed you know, pretty much everywhere. Well, each side was always trying to get client states to support their view, and Pakistan was ready to do that use with um, U.S. aid because they needed that money because of kind of all the turmoils that they had experienced. One thing that Pakistan could depend on was their military. And their mil military was very effective. They believed it needed to be because they had an enemy on their border. Many, with this relationship with the United States, many of these generals and other military people often would come to the United States to get training and then go back to Pakistan and rule. So there was this um, connection. Another thing about the military is that, remember I was telling you, there's kind of a, almost a, ca a class system that existed in Pakistan. Well, the one thing where you could have upward mobility to this day in Pakistan is the military. You can come in as a poor person and you can rise through the ranks in the military. That's one way that you can, you know, to, to better your, life, your lives. Um, so Pakistan would move from political leaders to military leaders uh, back and forth through coups. Um, one of such coup was um, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and um, the general who would launch a coup against him was Zia al-Haq in 1977. Um, and so most of these coups were carried out uh, with the eye on impending danger from India as a pretext. They would always say, we need to make sure we establish um, you know, calm and, and security within Pakistan. <clears throat> and what you see is this instability led to military weakness. So that brings us to the 80s. And uh, the 80s were, um, in this region, were very active uh, politically. Uh, for those that were around for it, I know there are some of you, in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. And um, the, when the Soviets moved in and took over large swaths of Afghanistan, the large groups of Muslims thought that because the Soviet Union was, um, they were godless, right, that they didn't, they, they, didn't, they promoted um, atheism, that they had to kick these people out because they were not religious. And so what we end up seeing is Islamic fundamentalists largely called uh, the Mujahideen, Mujahideen, they called a jihad against the holy war against the Soviets. And they were calling throughout the Muslim world, come to um, Afghanistan and fight against these godless communists who had taken us over. And so, because it's the Soviet Union and the Cold War was going on, what you see is the United States ends up backing the, the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union because the United States wanted to weaken their key enemy in the world, the Soviet Union. And so Pakistan begins, to, it becomes the key kind of entryway for a lot of these Mujahideen and a lot of the supplies that the United States are provided into the war in Afghanistan. And when the Soviets withdrew from, um, from Afghanistan, then you're left with large numbers of um, a lot of these militants that still existed in Afghanistan. One of them you're probably familiar with, Osama bin Laden, where he kind of made his name, <coughs> excuse me, in the, in the war in Afghanistan. Um, so, when the Afghan Taliban militants took over Afghanistan in 1997, and the Taliban were localized groups who, um, some of them had supported the, um, the kind of the, the more radical elements, that Pakistan actually recognized the Taliban. It was very kind of short-lived. Um, in 1998, another um, key thing happens in Pakistan, that they obtained the nuclear bomb, and they became the first Islamic country to obtain the nuclear bomb. And the reason that they did was because the Indians had the nuclear bomb, and they wanted to kind of keep up with um, the Indians in case ever you know major war broke out. They would be at a significant disadvantage. And of course, this was um, this increased tensions between uh, the two countries um, that 
kind of, you know, had carried on. So this brings us to 9-11. And when the um, suicide attackers attacked the United States in 9-11, they did so from, uh, largely from Afghanistan. And um, because of that, the relationship between the United States and Pakistan would in some ways grow closer, but in other ways become more strained as these kind of this relationship of how to deal with the extremists that were in Afghanistan. Um, U.S. invaded Afghanistan uh, in, uh, following the 9-11 attacks. Um, the Pakistan um, kind of turned away from the Taliban, and um, at least vocally, and supported the Western coalition that was fighting in um, Afghanistan. But a lot of the people that were on the ground, especially those that were in the Western kind of provinces, um, in Swat Valley and other, were, and other places, had a strong ties with uh, those that were uh, on the other side of the border because both were Pashtuns. And so, you know, this was a, a, a big deal. Um, when the United States imposed this gentleman here or helped bring him to power, Hamid Karzai, being a U.S. ally, um, Pakistan covertly uh, opposed him. And this caused tension, obviously, between the United States and Pakistan. Another thing the United States did, because they saw the fight, the kind of this new global war on terror, just like in Yemen, just like in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, the U.S. began using drone strikes to deal with the people that they considered to be um, militants. From um, roughly, um, you know, beginning of the operations up through, um, you know, the next decade or so, there would be 2,000 suspected militants that would be killed by drone attacks and upwards of 138 um, civilians. And so this, again, heightens, heightened tensions between um, the United States and Pakistan. Um, and obviously the people there became more and more angry at the United States because of our meddling in their sovereign right to, to rule. Um, so this was uh, a big issue. Um, Two other things caused big strains between the United States and Pakistan. One was the bin Laden raid, because when the United States went after bin Laden in 2011 and um, killed him at his compound, this compound was in Pakistan. And the United States was afraid to tell anybody in Pakistan that they were going to do the raid because they didn't know if some of the people were connected that could get, tell him that they were coming and um, you know, this, then they, they would be prepared or he could leave or whatever. So they didn't tell Pakistan that, that we were going to attack, the U.S. was going to attack them. And um, so they brought in helicopters and they into Pakistani space and, and carried out this raid. And so again, this created uh, more tension. And the, and the other thing is uh, Malala Yousafzai, um, seen here. She lived in the Swat Valley, and you guys are probably familiar with her, seen pictures of her. But one thing that she did is that she promoted um, girls' education in, um, in the Swat area of uh, Pakistan, and Pakistan in general. And some of the traditional uh, Taliban that existed there, um, they shot her. Uh, and she, they didn't think she was going to live. She was in the hospital for a long time, but she did live. And she's gone on to be a key spokesperson for um, women's uh, education throughout the world. And the last thing that I'll touch on before I kind of uh, close out here is that recently President Trump uh, cut the $300 million of U.S. aid to Pakistan, as he's been kind of doing um, everywhere. And he's claiming that the Pakistan government doesn't do enough to fight the militants who are um, aiding the, the, in, in Afghanistan. And so, right or wrong, this was kind of the, the last thing that, that I was going to cover um, on this. Um, so some of the issues of Pakistani's future is that there continues to be terrorist attacks in uh, Pakistan. Um, some of the key cities have had suicide bombers. There's this notion of secularism versus conservatives, uh, conservatism that's um, kind of at issue. Um, the only thing that's really holding everything together, as I mentioned before, was the Pakistani army, which remains uh, very strong. Another issue that Pakistan has is that their population continues to rise. There was a UN report that said upwards of 60% of Pakistani children are born stunted and because there's not enough food to feed all the people uh, in Pakistan. So this is kind of one of the things that, uh, that Pakistan is having to deal with. 
And obviously cutting aid is not going to help. Not that necessarily that that aid went to the people. A lot of that went to military hardware and, and supplies and those kinds of things. But you know, Pakistan has uh, a lot of issues. Um, resources and education are some of the things that are really strained in, in Pakistan today. Um, last thing is um, coming back to Ms. Marvel, who herself is a Pakistani American. The largest number of Pakistani Americans in the United States reside in the New York City area. Um, the book is set in New Jersey, and that fits in kind of the pocket where um, the largest number of Pakistani Americans are. There's a large population in California, but has anybody in here been to Devon before? That, if you've ever been there, you'll notice that there's a large number of Pakistanis in Devon. This picture here was taken in Devon. They actually have a name, uh, a street named after Jinnah, who was the one who pushed for um, um, you know, Muslim independence uh, partition from India. And so that's it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions that they may have about Pakistan or India or anything in this narrative? Not a question. That's a good question. Um, I do not know the answer to that right offhand. Um, I know that's horrible. I should know that, but I don't. What's that? It did just change. Maybe somebody can Google it real quick by um, answering another question. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the question was, you know, I, I was talking about how this probably wouldn't have happened if there wasn't colonization. There definitely was, there were, as I showed in, on that one map, there were huge pockets uh, within the British Empire, then even before that, where the, uh, most of the people were Muslim. But the interesting thing is, just like there were big pockets of people that were Hindu, they lived side by side. Like the big town that I had mentioned, um, Lahore, prior to partition, there was, it was predominantly Muslim, but it had a huge neighborhoods of Hindus. And a lot of the Hindus there were um, business owners, and you know, they'd been like that for centuries. And so if you didn't have the British to come in as kind of being the lords to be able to make this division with the help of the leaders, then they would have kind of figured it out on their own. Now, whether they would have eventually evolved into states or whatever, they would have done so. But I think it was the shock of doing it in such a short amount of time that caused so much chaos, right? So, you know, if you think of American history or whatever, and you think of the kind of the divisions that occurred without kind of violence, a lot of those, have t those are done over time, right? But this idea that we're going to divide the line here, and this is all of a sudden going to be, you know, Muslim majority or, or whatever, it created so much um, kind of hesitation and, and like what the future is going to bring that it really brought the worst out in people, if that answers the question. Arif Ali, yeah. A con, right. Good, thank you for that. I feel horrible that I didn't, don't know that. I should know that. I do that know that now. So, um, Any other questions? All right, well, thanks so much for coming.